show committed to equipping you to hone your media skills better to stand out from the crowd as a go-to expert in your field. Each week, Rich Montreger interviews top leaders, influencers, authors, speakers, podcasters, and media professionals about how to leverage media best to help you shine brighter on camera and stage as a go-to expert. Now, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Montreger. Well, welcome back once again to another Rocks of Stage Sunday night, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, back once again. And we're going to have a wonderful conversation about the amazing, amazing world of communication, how easily it is for everyone to communicate, right? <laughs> Actually, in the business world, in culture, really, it all starts at the top. How well is your organization ready to communicate, to connect, to have a relationship, drive your company, drive your business, or maybe just your family and your other relationships. Coming out of COVID, it's been a little bit tougher and everyone's still trying to refigure out the world of connectivity. Tonight, my guest is going to get deeper into that as we dive into a wonderful conversation here on Rock the Stage. But first, let's thank our sponsors. Adavita Studios is with us, of course. Adavita Studios works with you to produce your audiobooks, your podcast series, and distribute it widely throughout the marketplace. Adavita is connecting your voice to the world. And for more information, reach out to adavita.com. And Suspiciously Convenient Productions is with us once again, helping make this all possible. Located in Canada, they'll help you produce your film or TV series. Reach out to Suspiciously Convenient Productions. Tonight, it's all about communication and connectivity. What's it like to reconnect with people and do it at a high productive level? My guest tonight has over three decades of experience working with dozens of professional sports teams across three different leagues, hundreds of businesses, associations, military leaders, and collegiate athlete programs. Her transformative programs help people connect and communicate better. It helps to have a culture of respect and collaboration. And also, to get peak performance and succeed, you've all got to be on the same page, communicating together with one purpose and one mission in mind. Welcome. Elaine to the show tonight. Welcome. Great to see you. Thank you, Rich. It's great to be here with you tonight. So a podcast about communication and relationship. What a perfect blend of everything, isn't it? It is. <laughs> they go hand in hand, don't they? So I'm kind of curious. You have worked with NFL, Major League Baseball. You've worked with a lot of high-end leaders. And I want to start here because I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. As a communicator, but as a female, you're working with a lot of big, tough men. How in the world do you communicate with those guys? You know, and you should see me next to them because people, when I show up places, they go, you look a lot bigger in your head shots than you do now. Because I walk in the door, I'm five foot three and I weigh 105 pounds. So I'm diminutive, I guess was what we would say. So I'm standing around these gentle giants of sports and even major league baseball. That was a shocker. First team I worked for was the Phillies and I walked in the door and it was like, whoa, these guys are as big as football players. So, um, you know, you just communicate. They, people like authenticity mm -hmm. and they like honesty. And if you're authentic, they can connect with you. And it was really interesting story because when um, the Tennessee Titans, they were considering me to come in and present to their rookies. So they reached out to my contact at the Baltimore Ravens and my contact there said to the guy at the Titans, she walks in the room. I don't think she weighs a hundred pounds wet. And the guys take one look at her and they go, what the hell? And then she opens her mouth. I grew up in New Jersey. We are open, honest, and we have a lot of moxie. So, well, you know that's got to help you because those guys, locker room talk, everyone's got a little bit more bravado than they really have. And they're all trying to show off for each other. And it is part of their culture. And you do have to come in probably and hit that culture first and then teach them how to communicate a different way, right? Well, I do. And, and, and I, have to, um, I have to break through the barrier. Yeah. Because we make assumptions, you know, within seven seconds, we look at a person and we make an assumption about who they are and what they do. So I've got to break through that barrier first. I also have to break through the barrier of being a female, being the only woman in the room. You know, I could be in a room with 150 guys and I feel totally comfortable. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and trying to get them to understand that I'm not there to just go blah, 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 blah at them. But I want it to be a give and take conversation 
And when I get into critical conversations, especially when I talk to young men about sexual assault and, and violence and whatnot, mm. they ask a ton of questions because they're confused. Because a lot of times women are throwing themselves at these guys because yeah. they, they want to like ride on the coattails of their successes. Like, ching, these are bragging rights. This guy's got money. He's got this and that. And so um, they can get into a lot of complicated, confusing, life-altering situations. And so I am so honest with them. Um, I really, if anybody's asking questions, I'm not leaving the room. I'll let the program go as long as we need to. So that communication, that give and take is is really important. Well, and, and like you touched on a very interesting point here, because again, I've, I've worked around the sports world all my life and people do flirt, they tease, they have fun, they, they kind of rub shoulders just because it's cool and it's neat. And we're talking about that connectivity there. The lines get blurred and you don't know how you're really connecting after a while. You don't know if you are just a worker who's having fun. You don't know if there really is a flirt going on and you don't know if it's, Highly inappropriate. That that connection gets really blurry really fast, doesn't it? Yes, and it's confusing for people. I, I did front office training for the Texas Rangers, and someone high up in the organization came to me, and, and this was after the Me Too movement, and he said, Elaine, this is really difficult for a lot of us because you have a coworker that's dressed very nicely, and you want to tell them, oh, you look really nice today, yes. but you don't want them to misunderstand your intentions, and so there's it's it's almost turning into this black and white like you can't say anything nice or somebody right. may well you're harassing them and um it's just where where do you go with it it's very it's getting very confusing for people no it is because again elaine your hair looks beautiful tonight and i love the earrings now what did rich just really say <laughs> right, right right no it is so i i you know it's considered harassment when it's repeated and when it makes a person feel uncomfortable. So to say something once, say, you look nice today, that's that's okay. But when it's continual, and again, they call that severe and pervasive. And then that's when it becomes harassment. So. so we're coming out of COVID lockdown, and a lot of people I've talked with, school teachers especially, are struggling with the idea. The conduct and behavior rules kind of changed, but they shouldn't have changed. We're coming back to bad communication, bad connectivity. We don't know how to look each other in the eye. We don't know how to start a sentence up. What happened in three years that we've all gone crazy with connectivity? Oh, Rich, it is so sad. People become agoraphobic. We got comfortable in our homes. We got comfortable wearing our slippers and our flannel pants. And so like, that go anywhere <laughs> and I'm my my husband, who is the, probably one of the most social people I know, he accuses me of being pathologically social. So I grew up with a father who knew how to work a crowd. And and it's always been told that of the three kids, I am most like my dad. I mean, my 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 siblings are do pretty well too. But I didn't lose that social ability because every day during COVID, I made it a point to call a friend and have a long conversation. And it, and then, of course, we were doing lots of Zoom parties and gatherings. And I live in a neighborhood where everybody was walking every day. And so you could safely see people and you can safely socialize. But what saddens me is that I have a number of, especially people in college now, they'll say to me, well, how do I start a conversation? And it breaks my heart when I hear this. It really does. And it, it's like openers. You know, the simple one-liners, how are you today? This weather's awful today. Um, where did you grow up? Things like that. I, I was in one of my favorite stories because I have picked up a lot of my friends with just one-liners. I dear Lifelong friends that I've had for 34 years now. We just went to their daughter's wedding, met her in the grocery store telling her how beautiful her daughter's eyes were. And then the one of my favorites is that I was in the Charlotte airport going through security one morning and I turned this really tall guy behind me. Everybody's taller than me. And I said, this gets really old after a while, doesn't it? And we just started chatting back and forth, just light. And then we got to the other side of security. Turns out his name is Dave Sanderson and he is, was the last person to exit the plane that Sully landed on the Hudson River. And oh. Sully went off last, but he was the last passenger because he said, as people were going, my mom always told me if I did the right thing, God would take care of me. That was his quote. 
and we become good friends. He was starting to speak and I mentored him and talked to him. And then just recently I was in the post office waiting for the window to open. This window was when woman was in front of me and I, I just happened to say to her out of the blue, yeah, that window was closed or no, the line was out the door yesterday at four o'clock. So I decided to come back and we started talking and it turns out that her husband is Bill Baird and he is famously known as the father of birth control. And he was arrested eight times in five different states in the 60s advocating for women to be able to have their reproductive rights and use birth control. So I'm meeting all these, you don't know who's sitting next to you. Well, and for me, that's always been the fun of connectivity. Yeah. But let's dive into that opening line. Why are we so befuddled? Why are we so stuck with the simple hi? Have, have we gone to the point where we think we have to be so big and grandiose with the opening line? And simple always works, right? You know, that's a good point. I never even considered that, but maybe that's what it is. Maybe we we tend to overthink everything. Yes. These days, everything has to be so right and such a high caliber level. Let's just dial it back and just be natural and be loose. That's because that's who we all are in the in, in, to begin with, no matter how much money you make, how little money you make. We just, people want, we're human beings. We want to connect. Look somebody in the eye. When you're going down the street in New York City, I grew up 15 miles outside of New York. You didn't make eye contact with people, but I'll tell you what, when you do, you can tell you made somebody's day and they just smile. It's humanity. Well, this is what we should be doing. Well, and then you're you're getting into the simple things, a smile, just a smile from across the room. Some of them can stop and you will end up bumping each other in the food line as you're at the buffet together and you'll start talking because one smile started it up. It, Did you know it that make it brain, way harder than we have to be. The brain is wired to receive smiles. And actually when somebody smiles at you, you get a rush of dopamine. So it makes other people happy. Well, again, go back to dating. You glance across the room, but you don't want to be seen glance across the room. You, 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 the guys and girls do it back and forth. So you're peeking. You want to see. You want to connect, but you don't want to just stir somebody. But that's really creepy when you do that. So this stuff is important, but we've lost the simpleness, haven't we? We have, we have, and it's truly sad. And you know what, Rich, I blame I, I blame social media for a lot of it. I blame cell phones for a lot of it because everybody is staring down. I spoke in New York City a couple months ago and I was so sad because again, I, I grew up there. I used to just hop on the train and get in all the time by myself. And walking through the city now is such a different experience because everybody's staring down. Everybody's looking at this little device and nobody- yes connecting with anybody else. And it really saddens me because we're losing out on so much. And, you know, there's an interesting study that came out of Stanford University back in the 70s. And it discusses the value of what we call weak ties. And what we find is that the people that will give you the greatest opportunities, especially in your career advancement, are people who you glance by nonchalantly. And it's not people that you know dearly or that are within your your inner intimately or know that in your inner circle mm -hmm. and so it's so important to talk to somebody because you don't know person who got me on the national circuit i knew him from one hour totally changed my life really yeah yep that was it dean of students at a campus that was just eight miles away or eight minutes away brought me back to his office do you have a speaking agent i said no and he goes, well, there's people that do this for a living. And this guy liked my program so much that he spent all this time helping me and getting me out there on the national circuit. So well, you don't know, we're losing out on so much because you don't know who's sitting next to you. Well, you bring up the speaking world. You and I have both been on stage many times. We're both public speakers, both part of the National Speaker Association. And it's amazing how many introverts are on stage because they can connect on the big stage but you get off stage and you walk the hallway and they're like the scared mouse they don't want to look at you do anything it's weird how we'll go big but the intimate connection scares us why is yes, that yes i i don't maybe because they just don't feel secure doing it one-on-one -on -one, you know and 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 i i guess i think a lot of it has to do with self-confidence but it's interesting because you mentioned the word big they can go big and have the yeah. confidence that but it's safe because they don't have to talk to one another i i have a neighbor who can barely say hello but this neighbor is a teacher 
So there must be some connection that's happening, yeah. but walking by, it's can barely look, you know, you in the eye. So it's it's, just... it's because for me, the stage has always been connection to the sit down conversation. I want to be on the stage. I want to have a good conversation. And when I hold my card or when I tell I'm going to be in the back of the room, I want you to come up to me, actually talk to me. Yes. And I, I thought that's what we're supposed to do. I thought we were supposed to go from big to smaller to intimate to do this well. But I think again, through COVID and other things, we've lost we've lost the back of the room for speakers and other people. The back room is not the same back room that it used to be. Is that part of the trouble? We're really having trouble coming out of COVID, coming back in the full freedom of communication. Well, I think so because a lot of people lost their skills. And so that's what happened. That's why we lost the back of the room. But I, I, I think that, you know, it's the back of the room is so important. I, I did a keynote this summer and we arrived a couple of days early and mm -hmm. I stayed an extra day and got to know these people. Snow and Ice Management Association. These are the people that keep us safe in the winter. And I learned more about salt than I ever knew in my whole life. And um, but I, I just came to love this community so much. And I it makes us better at what we do when you take time to communicate with your clients before and most importantly after, because then you learn what touched them, what they took away. And we can continue to to change, you know, I, you know, being a speaker, it's an evolution. We're always evolving. Yes. Yes. We're always changing our content. And things change around us. So how are you going to meet people's needs unless you don't know, if you don't know what they are? Well, you're, you're touching on two things I think are really important here in this conversation is one of them is going to be, you got to be curious. You have to be curious about wanting to learn about other people. That's number one. Yes. Number two is, and I'm very strong about this, you need to shut up and be more of an active listeners so you can have a real connection. So Take either one of those and where do you want to go? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with shutting up because my favorite quotes and probably my LinkedIn post that got the most impressions, 13,000 impressions was when I discussed Larry King and Larry King infamously said that about five minutes before he was signing off on his final show, I did not learn anything while I was talking. Boom. Mm. And that says it all. And so, and we, we spend so much time, we spend a very small percentage of our time listening. And then the rest of the time we're spacing out and formulating our response. And we really need to be better listeners and to zero in on that person and to have appropriate feedback and give and take and even body language, looking them in the eye, nodding, yes. letting them know that you're with them. And that's, that's important. Well, and like you bring up Larry King, I can picture him with the suspenders leaning over the desk. He, he leans in a little bit and he'll get right up in there. And when, when you're done talking, he'll pause because he's not got the question yet. He's still listening to you. And then he's got to bring the question. He deliberately did that so well to grab the nuggets, to get the important, to mine it deeper. And I think everyone got a connection with him. I think everyone that was ever on Larry King got a deeper connection with the man. Is that part of it? We need to be listening that well instead yes. of thinking of the next thing and thinking of the next thing? Yes, because you're with them and you're learning. And then when you take that information in, then you can respond accordingly instead of just hopping from one thing to another. You know, sometimes we, we come across people who um, you're, you're speaking with and you can't even finish a sentence. And they're no. taking it and going here, here and they're going there. And, and it's just like, Wait, can I finish? <laughs> you know? Yes, it's it's really, and then 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 you get into this whole idea of the conversation of mining the conversation. Again, I am a master interview. I know how to listen to people and listen to that one little phrase, that one little thing. I watch your body language, and it's fun to surprise people and go deeper. Because a lot of people want to go deeper. They, right. they they want to go to the next layer, but we don't know how to mine that relationship to go deeper, but a lot of people want to have a surprise question. They want to be heard and make a deeper connection. How can we help people here with that, Elaine? How, how can you give us some tips to help us get that mining down better to, to not be superficial, but really connect and have relationships? Well, you said that one word earlier, curious. Be curious about people. 
have a love for people and respect people no matter who they are. I often tell people that that woman that's cleaning the bathroom in the airport is just as important and needs as much respect as the CEO of a corporation because we're all part of this system and we're all intermingled. If you didn't have that woman cleaning the bathroom, what would it look like? And she works hard and she probably has a very tough life and we need to understand that. And so I talk to everybody. I love people no matter who they are. And, and I come from a, a blue collar neighborhood and um, I, I still in touch with a lot of people that I grew up with. And then I can hobnob with millionaires and I love them all for every experience because everybody brings something different to the table. So it's being curious and it's asking questions that helps yeah. to, 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 to uh, feed into that curiosity to, you know, so you learn more. And so I think that that's important is the, I ask a ton of questions usually when I talk to people. And sometimes my husband and I will get together with people and he'll, he'll go, well, well, they sure talked a lot. We didn't get a word in it twice. And I said, yeah, but that, you have to understand I'm asking them a ton of questions and not giving us a chance to, to have yeah. the platform because I just, I'm curious. I love people. The, the other thing that falls into this is trying to make that connection assumptions and stereotypes. We often see somebody, they dress that way, they walk that way, they get out of that, that car, and we, I can't connect with them. I, I can't go talk to them. We have this list of pre-built barriers and assumptions when in fact, and again, many celebrities, many celebrities talk about this. I'm single and no one will ask me out. <laughs> Can someone please ask me out? We make assumptions that keep us from having connectivity, don't we? Well, we do. And, and we have to realize that we have these biases and our unconscious biases are, are part of a protective mechanism that goes back um, for, for, you know, eons and eons ago. And if somebody looks like us, we feel safe. But if somebody doesn't look like us, then the brain goes into high alert. Caution, caution, caution. Right. And so that's what leads us to make, the, I mean, within a tenth of a second, we're judging people on their age and their race and their gender. And then by seven seconds, we've made the assumptions. I talk about this when I do my diverse, my inclusion programs. And so my, my favorite stereotype story is I was in Atlanta. I spoke one evening and I was taken, I always take the very first flight out the next morning. And um, I had an Uber driver pull up to the hotel and it's five, four thirty in the morning. And this guy pulls up the cars a little bit, you know, not, not the highest end car. And he's got tattoos all over. He's got multiple piercings. His hair is shaved on the side and it's spiked straight up from back to front. So I get in the back and you can imagine the assumption that I made. Yeah. And of course, I talk to everybody and we start talking. And it turns out that this guy has three degrees, one from being from MIT. And he was brilliant. He was sweet. He was sensitive. And he didn't fit into the corporate world because of what he looked like. So you think about the value that some of these organizations might have lost because they fed into the stereotypes and they didn't want to hire him based on what's here and not what's in here and in here. So. Now, interesting you bring that up. One of my funnest thing is meeting people with tattoo. Now I do not have a tattoo on my body. I don't want a tattoo on my body, but when I see other people's tattoos, most of them have a story behind it. And I have found instead of turning away, going, oh my gosh, if I have the chance to sit down on a bus, sit down someplace, I'll ask you, by the way, that, that, that's pretty cool. Can, can you tell me about that? And this heart pours out this amazing story of a life or a death or a child or an anniversary. And all of a sudden, because they have that thing that some people are repelled by, this is actually their badge of talk to me. Let me tell you something cool. Have you run into that, that it's completely the opposite of what we think it is? I just love that. That's your opening line. That's your simple opener. Tell me about yes. your tattoo. Yeah. You no, know, and 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 I, I never even thought about that. And I it works over it's, and over it's again. Personal. If somebody is willing to put that on their body, it has a meaning to them. And wow. of course, we're from the generation that are not tattooing ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it you know, differently. It's like, oh my God, there's sleeves. Where's that beautiful yes. skin? But it's okay. It's, it's what it is, you know? Or, 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 or they get into like, well, it used to be at this, but now I painted over and did that because, and so the stories unfold. And 
if you just take time, that's what a lot of this is, I think. We're so busy, we're moving, and we won't stop to make a connection anymore. We, we just, uh, we don't yeah. sit still, do we? I love it because I just recorded a story about that um, for a contest. And being in the Philadelphia airport, coming back into the parking garage by myself one night, yeah. knowing that there's a lot of homeless people sleeping there and never feeling comfortable. And this was after midnight because my flight was delayed. And I approached the garage. I can see that there was a homeless man just on the other side of the glass doors, front and center. And I'm like, no, you're not going. And I turned around and I went back and I looked in search for somebody that could walk me to my car. And I see a young man that's em emptying the trash receptacles. So he agreed to do it. He was sweet. We we're talking. We get there. The home, the doors part open and a homeless guy comes lunging at us. And my escort yells out, it's my uncle. I'm like, I'm like, you can't make this you know what up and so I, I i watched them and then he said to me it's okay you can go you're safe as and the two of them just stayed and as i exited the garage i stopped i watched them from my car and they were you could just feel the love between them and as i drove out i was immediately hit with a sense of regret why didn't i stay and talk to them you know, and, and learn their story and perhaps have an opportunity to help. And I end the story saying, we get so caught up in our mundane day-to-day -day little goals that we don't take the time to stop and look and listen to others. Because when we do, that's when we're afforded the opportunities to help somebody and there's no greater satisfaction. How many opportunities have we missed? Oh, Because tough. we didn't give them an extra five, an extra 10, whatever it is. How many have we missed? And I think that's part of the lost art now. It, it really is because yeah. growing up, we were on my grandma and grandfather's back porch and people would gather for, you know, Sunday church, post dinner, fun, games. And it was multi-generational, multi-political. And we had so much fun just being. And it was the simple conversations again. We were connected. Uh, and it's those simple moments where you're in the moment and nobody's got a cell phone that they're distracted. No. We, were, we were so connected. The con the connectivity was so... There's a really good book called um, Lost Connections by Johan Harry, and I highly recommend it to people. And he talks about how we've been slowly disconnecting, I think, to the 30s, starting you know, with the advent of radio and then TV and these things that were taking us from sitting down and talking to each other face to face. But the um, best thing we can do is put down our devices. Even when you sit down with a person at a table to eat dinner, don't put your device on the table. It, show, it's, it just sends this body language. I'm waiting for something better to come in. Something more important, something better. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. And it's, it's counterproductive to making a connection and going deeper with people. Yeah. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. So, you know, in business, it's all about connecting. It's about connecting to your clients. I'm self-represented and I've loved that. I don't have an agent. And the reason that I do like it is because by the time I get somewhere, I'm good friends. Like I, I've been um, asked to do two opening keynotes for a conference in um, March. And the woman that has contracted me to do this she and I talked on the phone for an hour the other day. We had a great conversation. And I, I'm like, I can't wait to, you know, it's usually like, I can't wait to hug you when I see you. And right. yes. that's what it's about. Well, and even a hug. Now, post-COVID, people just, they don't know if they should. Now, I'm a natural hugger. I mean, I, I, I see people, I'm going to give a hug. Um, <laughs> over this year, I was back at an event and met someone that we had not met in person. It's only been virtual whole way through they saw me across the room and they yelled trigger as loud as they could and everyone's like heck are you and we come up and without even without even thinking about it we gave a long hug and a high and laughing it was instinctual i don't think that's true anymore for most people i i, I don't think we're instinctually ready to just say oh it's really great to see you I know it's like some people just don't want to be touched or they think it's creepy. And I'm half Italian. My grandpa immigrated <laughs> from Italy and your, your front porch was reminding me of my grandpa's front porch. We were, we had yeah. wild times in that front porch in Cranford, New Jersey, and watching the trains go from the factory across the street, going into New York. It was a blast. But 
we're physical people. We touch. Mm -hmm. Italians are touchy feely. And I hug people and it stops. So sometimes I'll just say, is it okay if I hug you? And <laughs> I usually forget that. that step. I usually just go right in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to ask me. You're safe. So let's go back to the business world for a second because it really is a struggle in the business world. Because we now have different rules, expectations, boundaries. What can we do to help mitigate that, to help it be a more connected place without breaking the boundary that we're all afraid of now, of the harassment, the other things like that. But the workplace has got to be a place of fun, enjoyment, connectivity. We spend a majority of our time with other people at the office or in a work environment. I think what leaders should do is encourage people to communicate face to face. If you've got somebody in a cubicle next to you, don't send them an email. Stand up and look over the wall and, and just have those conversations. My son is working remotely. He lives in Philly and um, he's been remote, but they do a phenomenal job of getting people to get together. They go play disc golf. They'll play um, you know, different, they'll, they'll just have these social events. And mm -hmm. he now has a really nice group of friends through his work. Well, and recently a, a new article came out here in Washington, D.C., where I'm at. D.C. was voted the most lonely city in the United States. Mm. Now, D.C. is always buzzing. There's always international and this and that. There's always something going on. And it does rotate and flips about every four, four years. The population and new people come in because of presidencies and other things like that. But it's the loneliest place in the United States with all the buzz. They I can see connected. that because people aren't settled in. When you when you are turning over your population every four years and even two years, you have congressional members that maybe I, can get voted out after two years. I can see where that would happen. It's sad. It's it, it, again, and and we're the people leading the nation. We're the people trying to help you, but we aren't connected ourselves, and it, it just ripples. It's a great example of the ripple effect of disconnectivity. Now it's impacting us. Right. Bring that down home, bring it down to your business. It's the same thing is happening there. Yep. Yep. That's true. And then when you've got so many people that are disconnected, how connected are they to our needs and what is happening in our world? Listening again, empathy, understanding. Yep. The whole All list goes that. on and on. And, you know, I think the important thing too with listening, and, and I talk about this a lot in my programs, is perspective. And perspective is mm. so important because what we find is that we all have been raised differently. We all have different parents and different values and different circumstances. Some people lost parents early. Some people were, you know, challenged. There were so many different things. And with every decision we make, we bring that history with us. And so we need to be willing to listen to other people to learn their stories so we understand their perspectives and where they're coming from. Because organizations that have a more diverse pool are more innovative and profitable than those that have a higher intellectual pool. But you've got to be able to see eye to eye, be able to collaborate, be willing to compromise. We don't have compromise in government, that's for sure these days. You know, just all this. It's like, I don't want that person to succeed. So we're just going to blow it all up and not let anything happen. And you just see a lot of that. So we have to gain each other's perspectives because it's so diverse. Elaine, it's been great to have you on Rock the Stage here tonight. A wonderful conversation on connectivity and communication. Your QR code is popping up on the screen and I'll you know, take you to the website. But what's on your website? Who are you? What do you do? Who am I? What do I do? <laughs> I'm a professional speaker and trainer and keynoter, and I've worked with uh, uh, pro athletic teams, well, 31 teams across the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, which has been an amazing honor. And those are those I'm pinching myself moments. I've yeah. worked with many associations, uh, lots of businesses and corporations, and then worked with over 700 universities nationwide, I'm mostly working with collegiate athletes. So I've worked with a lot of notable Division One football programs, and I've had the honor of working with the military. And I've done parent programs. I've worked with high schools. I've just, you know, over the course of three decades, you just, you keep yourself open and you never know what's going to come your way. And so I hit that QR code, 
go and learn more about Elaine, all the things she just told you about right there. Can they also book a call with you there? How do they best connect with you? Is it through the website or is there a better email? They can connect with me, Elaine, at elainepasqua.com. Very simple. Okay. You made that too easy. You made that too easy. Elaine at elainepasqua.com, which is on my website. So, okay. Elaine Pasqua, it's great to have you here with us tonight. Any final thoughts to land the plane on relationship, communication, connectivity? Anything anything extra you want to add in before we say goodnight? No, I think we've covered so much of it, Rich. It's just, again, embrace people. Embrace the world around you. It's a beautiful place. And when you connect with people, it becomes even more beautiful. Elaine Pasqua, thanks for being on Rock to Stage with us here tonight. Thank you. Pleasure. Don't forget, we're going to do Rock to Stage Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We're back here again for another in-depth conversation. Highly unscripted, but always in-depth, entertaining, fun, and informative to help you with your life, your world, and, of course, to get you rocking the stage very often, whatever your career and your path is. We do want to thank our sponsors for making it all possible. Out of Vita Studios is connecting your voice to the world. They're making your podcasts, your audiobooks, and helping you produce them and then send them out. For more, more information, go to autovita.com and Suspiciously Convenient Productions. Located in Canada, just over the border, but they're helping you produce your films, your TV series. If you have a creative idea that you've always wanted to get produced, reach out to Suspiciously Convenient Productions. That's going to do it for this week. I'm the Trigger at Rich Bontrager. We'll be back here again 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Remember, come ready to join our premier parties Join the chat, get in the conversation, share your thoughts. Sunday night, 7 p.m. with Rock the Stage. We'll see you next week right here.